Well, greetings. 
I think uh, we should just uh, begin here. My name is Patrick Marks and I am the proprietor of the Green Arcade. And I'm really uh, proud uh, to be part of this and, and, and this amazing uh, get together with uh, Roxanne Denver Ortiz, Amy Sunny, James Tracy, Leticia Del Toro, and uh, Josiah Luis. Um, I would like to start off by saying that we, in fact, most of the people taking part are in San Francisco and some in Oakland. We want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Matush Ohlone, who are the original habit, inhabitants of San Francisco. I'd like to start off with a poem by Leticia. And uh, hello, it's been a while since you were at the Green Arcade. Yes, it's been a little while. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm hearing you great. Okay. And, uh, you are a still writing, a poet, uh, an essayist, originally from Crockett, California. And, yeah, very, uh, very local. <laughs> and you've won fiction prizes. You've been in Ziziva, About Place. And uh, we're looking forward to you opening up uh, the ceremonies, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I just want to say uh, thank you for the invite. I feel very honored to be here. Um, you're all doing amazing needed work. I'm going to start with a poem called Alive at Lampedusa. And it is actually from Poetry in Flight, Poesia in Vuelo. And this was published for the Ooh, I believe it was the 45th anniversary of El Tecolote um, newspaper in the mission. Alive at Lampedusa. On radio news, breaking word of drowning at Lampedusa. It is not a name I know, but sound bites of Italian coast, Roman mayor, deadly seas bring to mind so many other refugee ships. I'm thinking of Elian, I'm thinking of Cuba, of Ceuta, and death by water or death by desert. Which is more inhumane? Why does this report break my heart today? Is it the exotic port name or the thought of Eritrean souls downed in the Mediterranean? I once saw Euro tourists ferried with cars to islands of sumptuous beauty, Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, playgrounds for Europeos now haunted by Yemaya's children. I am the daughter of a man who at age 14 walked the desert for days, sunsick and weakened. He took blows to the head, then woke up in jail to witness the broomstick bombing of an elderly excuse me, broomstick beating of an elderly man. When my father died at 77, his house was empty except for a Bible, a typewriter, and notes of his own crossing at Yuma. I have strolled on Corsican beaches and know the summer throngs along the Côte d'Azur. What is that luxury worth? Will we not see their faces in the waves? Where does nationality go when the body disappears? They are fellow citizens of my paisas in the desert, the unnamed but numbered. How is it that we house the dead in modern stateside morgues, but we cannot shelter the living? We cannot afford a hand. When a child suckling his or her mother's milk empties the right breast, does she not move on to the left? Are we not free to search our madre tierra, as free to search and settle in her fertile curves? Refugees would survive the fire on the waters, did not stay put in their shelters in spite of welcome kits of deodorant and toothpaste. Officials were astounded by those who fled. To run free is to know you're hunted, but what is worse? Death by drowning on a fiery ship or death by heat and fortified funneling? A hell of bracken fields and barren waste that ends in Pima County to be alive at Lampedusa or Ceuta or Arizona could not only hold a 
could only hold a lamplight to your heart. You would know the gift of a new day, a drink of water, of refuge from the sun. For those of us settled, what can we give in this vast land grab that is our lives? Mired in property deeds and purchasing power, we will never know the force of hunger or the urge to run or the absolute gold that is every day of strength and life before you. Thanks. I think there's a second one I'm supposed to read, but I don't know about the timing, if it's happening now or later. Uh, please, uh, let's do it now. Okay. Thank you. Now. Um, this is called The Wailing. And uh, I started to write it at the beginning of uh, when we started hearing about the deaths and police abuse um, towards black men and women. Um, so it's, it's still relevant, unfortunately. For the parents who bury their children too soon, for Trayvon, Jordan, Tamir, Andy, Oscar, Michael, Sandra, and all the names we may not know. I stood at my brother's burial site and moved so someone stronger than me could hold my mother back, all of her leaning into the lowering, we the living there to hold her back. We kept arcing little bits of ourselves in between the loads of earth. We could not let him go. One more photo, one more rose, a ribbon follows, a child stuffed tiger, a kerchief and hold my mother back. The wailing raged more like a freight train, more like a mother quake. The fault lines of fury collide. A woman who buries her son must feel those first fetal flutters, then full term feet to ribs, rewinding ghost baby. Threads of milk flow some 30 years later, counter earthwise. I fed you to live, you hear all of her, liquefy, unroot, forget the ashes, forget the dust. The universe pulls you inside out, you want to go with your birth blood. The wailing is all, sound disappears, only heaving and heart work. I see the mothers and fathers in photo stills, mouths open, a roaring pose. I will not play the clips, I know the sound. A father upright in his bed, 4 a.m., pure rage fills the house. They tag the sun, all hours bereft. Rage has no words, immeasurable flight. Fury moves you, fury flows. The wailing multiplied is this movement now. The will to follow, whether son, brother, father, daughter, child, sister, oldest friend, lover you can never become. Keep moving, stay above ground, pace that place and take direction. Move the world and let the waves resound. Thanks. Boy, thank you so much. That was a great uh, beginning uh, of this evening. I'd like to introduce our uh, activists and writers and historians. And I am going to. Okay, here we are. So I'd like to introduce first uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Roxanne, thank you for all everything you've done for uh, so many young historians and for booksellers. <laughs> And uh, for so many uh, students, and also this, I think this book is really a summation of so much of your other work uh, in many ways. Uh, the book is called, uh, Roxanne's new book is called Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and the History of Erasure and Exclusion uh, from the great people at Beacon Press. And let me just hold that up looks backward on my screen. I don't know how that works. Um, Roxanne, uh, originally from Oklahoma, 
from a tenant farming family. And she actually has, a, uh, it is historical, but her also her work um, about her, she has some books that are like um, autobiographies, I guess, a trilogy. First one um, that I mentioned is Red Dirt from University of Oklahoma Press. Also Outlaw Woman, subtitled A Memoir of the War Years and Blood on the Border about her work and other people's work in Central America. Um, also, she in 2015 got the American Book Award for the Indigenous People's History of the United States, which I hope everyone has read. And if not, um, you should just read it again if you only read it once. Also, I want to let you know that uh, there is a, a really nice series. Uh, these are from Beacon Press as well. And that is the Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People, which uh, a lot of our fantastic uh, local um, schools have been taking, have, have uh, used. Also, um, All the Real Indians Died Off and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans. I'd like to mention that. And uh, uh, an earlier, a really amazing book called The Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, which actually has a foreword by um, Simon J. Ortiz, which we had talked about earlier, I think, before the public joined us. Um, and then uh, I think leading up to the new book was uh, this astounding treatise on the Second Amendment. Um, I mean, not to give it short shrift, but I mean, just briefly that the, uh, the Second Amendment basically, uh, from what I gleaned, uh, and you talk about this too in Not a Nation of Immigrants, had to do with the idea to bear arms was to track down, uh, track down runaway slaves and also to um, continue the westward um, colonial expansion uh, of taking land and um, killing the indigenous peoples. Um, then I'd like to um, uh, introduce James Tracy, because I think we're all gonna be, you guys will all be together in a, in a conversation. So let me introduce James, uh, great uh, friend, <laughs> also uh, a fantastic historian um, who deals a lot with, I guess what you might call the hidden histories, um, no longer hidden. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of the things that Roxanne talks about is this idea that the United States loves us to forget, just to forget. But I think the three people here tonight are have so much to do with what um, people remember, what they went through and how we can go forward. Um, he is a, an organizer, has done a lot of work with the homeless. Uh, I have his book somewhere, but I don't know where they went. Um, he uh, wrote uh, a book call, called, um, James, you have to help me. Uh, ah, Dispatches Against Displacement, Field Notes from San Francisco's Housing Wars from AK Press. And then also uh, 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 recently, uh, No Fascists USA, um, the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and Lessons for Today's Movements. Uh, and that's with Hillary Moore, but that was from uh, City Lights Books. And, uh, and, there, uh, the, and then also uh, we have uh, Amy Sunny here today, and we have the 10th anniversary of this amazing book, Hillbilly Nationalists. Uh, urban race rebels and black power interracial solidarity in 1960s the 1970s new left organizing so we'd like to uh ask you we'll ask you later about how you came to do another edition and what has happened in 10 years since the printing of that um amy sunny activist uh teacher uh librarian i think which is one of my favorite people are librarians. And uh, she was co-founder of the National Center for Media Justice. 
And uh, she actually, way back when, had a book with Allison Books, which I think is no longer even a publisher, called Revolutionary Voices, an anthology for and by queer and gen transgendered youth, which is one of those books that school districts love to ban. And uh, maybe we should talk about reprinting that and do a little publishing as well. So um, I, I just wanted to say that, uh, just give a couple of quotes about, um, from Nick Estes, um, the Lakota uh, fantastic historian said that historian Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz rightly argues that the United States is not a nation of immigrants, but more accurately, a nation of colonizers. And uh, Angela Y. Davis, uh, a hero of mine since I was like nine, I have to say, um, recovers the voices of white and hillbilly nationalists, recovers the voices of white working class radicals who prove abolitionist John Brown's legacy is alive and well. So I guess I'd like to just act, uh, ask you just to start talking about what your role as an historian, is, as historians, um, what your roles are and what how you are um, what you're trying to accomplish in, in these uh, amazing publishing ventures. Does anybody want to start, Roxanne? Well, I think um, um, we all are uh, historians. Um, I think uh, what we had planned is for James and uh, um, Amy to kick it off by asking questions. We're gonna ask each other questions. So you all wanna go ahead and ask your questions? Yeah, I'll go, go, go ahead and we will definitely return to Pat, Patrick's question. Yeah, that's a major. Uh, because it's kind of, kind of, kind of the, uh, the core of what we're talking about today. Uh, but Roxanne, so first of all, happy birthday. It has been an honor and my life to know you since you uh, you you accepted my uh, my phone call when our mutual friend Chris Crass said he could like that book so much you know she's in the phone book shows you how long we've we've been friends because there were phone books back then um, and been nothing but uh, support in every single last last way in my life so uh, happy birthday and many many more uh, my dear friend. Uh, my uh, my question for you is that I think uh, you know watching watching your grand argument that we are not a nation of immigrants evolve from different readings that I've seen you do over the year to this beautiful book that we have before us. Uh, I want to ask you you identify you identify the myth that we are a nation of immigrants as one of the most kind of destructive frameworks that we could ever adopt in hopes of undermining. Of racism and white supremacy and colonialism. What else? What are what are some of the other uh, ideas floating out there that maybe, you know, maybe floating out there tonight on MSNBC that uh, we need to, uh, you know, that, that we need to scrutinize as seriously as you have scrutinized uh, the myth of, that we are a nation of immigrants. Well, there are so many. <laughs> 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 um, it would take all night to uh, list them all, but I think, uh, you know, one thing we have before us now is this Afghanistan thing and um, the general idea that, you know, myth that uh, this is a benevolent uh, uh, nation, you know, that wants to help people around the world by bombing them, you know, it's a little contradiction that we haven't resolved, you know, how it is that uh, you make friends by bombing them or help them in any, any way. So I think the, um, the biggest myth is that this is, you know, this is not a militaristic society. It's the most militaristic society since Sparta. There's never been a day in the United States without war. I've tried to find one, I've challenged people. You find me a day, a day without war, the US at war against an enemy. Now the first hundred years that enemy was mainly Native Americans and Mexicans, but soon it was Filipinos and people from Guam and then all around the world. And now it's becoming 
of course, uh, China's on the, on the radar uh, for the chief enemy. So we're surrounded all the time. It's a surrounded, you know, it's a, uh, we're paranoid. Uh, I'm, I didn't invent that, you know, <laughs> it's been known for a long time. And we're armed to the teeth. <laughs> um, like no other nation in history, a uh, civilian arms. Um, a nation of immigrants, I think, is the important thing is that, um, that immigrants who come to the United States, who started coming uh, in the 1840s, everyone before then was a settler. Um, and these immigrants come to something already created and, and they, um, they don't understand this history. And so you have a, a constant inflow of people who believe the myths, largely believe these myths and accept them. So it reinforces uh, the myths by having new people come in who don't know the history. So uh, we have a, you know, a deficit of historical knowledge but I do think that militarism is is very is very central, and we should pay attention to it. Um, also, that um, uh, the myth of the white working class. I guess we can get into that. You know, as as we talk about uh, your book, uh, your new new edition of your fantastic book. It's such an important book. So I will, yeah. I won't go through a whole list. Those are representative. <laughs> Hi, you Rebecca. have a question? I do I have a question for you and I'm really excited to be in conversation on your birthday and in general. Um, so yeah, what a lovely Friday evening. Um, you know, when we when we met up to talk about what we might talk about tonight, um, one of the things that um, we, all we're really feeling and thinking about was this manufactured panic um, about attacks on white identity and not only from brazen white nationalists, but, you know, folks in my family who I've had conversations with who insist that somehow um, critical race theory is being taught in schools and children, particularly white children, are going to be, you know, taught to be ashamed and at risk. So I'm thinking about these like widespread attacks on just the basic teaching of truth about history and about racism um, that's being driven by just a really distorted understanding of what critical race theory is and also by disinformation campaigns. And so I want to hear your thinking um, about this panic over critical race theory. What is it really about? And is it possible to teach and use history to undermine the appeal of racism, fascism, and white nationalism? Great question. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, we noted, you know, in previous conversations that uh, it's interesting when you, in the United States, when you condemn something so strongly and it becomes in the news, it makes especially young people very curious about what, it, what this is all about. They perk up like, like I did in the 1950s when I started hearing about communism. I thought, what is this? You know? <laughs> And then you go and read the Communist Manifesto. It sounds pretty good, <laughs> actually. <laughs> exactly. So um, it can backfire. But I think in general, it's really disturbing. Um, it's disturbing because it, you know, it, it reveals a level of ignorance that is stunning. The state I come from, Oklahoma, I think they were the, actually the first to pass legislation they got, you know, up front and passed the legislation that it, it couldn't be taught, critical race theory could not be taught, or anything that would make uh, white children be ashamed of being white. I think that it was worded like that. And this goes from K to 12 to universities, uh, university level. So how that's going to play out, you know, is, is, and now I think there are 14 states that have, you know, some form of, of legislation, critical race theory. So there's this obscure theory of, you know, legal experts and scholars that we hardly ever tried to explain outside the academy that's now 
you know, now wide open. And it's very important because all it is, you know, basically is that it's a structural matter. It's not a matter of individual. It, it really is, is meant to make young, uh, you know, white person feel, no, you're not the guilty one. It's a structural thing in the society and you're manifesting something, but it's not your evil. You're, you know, you have bad seed in you or something. It's the opposite of that. So it's actually, uh, once people understand it's structural, they can become anti-racist, you know, and without shame, but, you know, with a lot of energy um, put into it, that they have something to contribute. And it, it's not demeaning to them, you know, it doesn't mean they're, um, they're a race, to be an anti-racist doesn't mean you're a racist. You know, it's the opposite. <laughs> You're an anti-racist. So, um, but I think it does show we have a lot of work to do uh, with the masses, you know, outside the academy, just in our communities, uh, in our families. Um, well, maybe maybe we can forget our families, <laughs> but, you know, for some of us, uh, but some of our families, the young ones, you know, especially, um, yeah, so I think um, I think what I'll do now is uh, read an excerpt from my book that would set us off to, it's a little bit challenging, uh, if I can find it here. Um, well, you know, I wanted to explain that my, my book is about how immigrants in the United States become settlers. Uh, Noel Ignative uh, wrote a book, how, how the Irish Became White, but I put it in how they become settlers and becoming settlers or, you know, becoming white, um, being accepted as white um, really requires uh, anti-black racism and, you know, total patriotism. So it's a very, very complex uh, thing that happens to immigrants. The processing, the Americanization processing, it's, it's a brutal. I go through it in, you know, very, very um, extended terms of, you know, what, how it's done. Uh, and I, I think I haven't ever seen anything else done like what I've tried to do is showing that process. And I was really writing that for immigrants or children of immigrants, um, because I think they need to understand it, you know, what, what's happening to them, what they have to go through. But to tell that story, um, I had to deal with genocidal settler colonialism, it has to be understood as a bedrock of the United States. Um, up until uh, the million plus Irish famine refugees arrived in the late um, 1840s, all previous Euro-American residents had come from or were descended from colonizers, uh, settlers who violently seized native lands, fields, villages, and fishing grounds, killing or driving residents out. So by 1850, um, settlers and, and the government and the army had conquered the continent on paper, although tremendous armed indigenous resistance continued for another half century in the Northern Plains and the Southwest. And you know that through names like Geronimo, Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull. Um, so it wasn't done, it was on paper, but it, uh, to make it a reality required it or required genocide. So I'll read a, a brief segment from chapter two of the book. Um, it's a chapter on settler colonialism that relies on, um, it relates uh, in this chapter, I relate a background of the hillbilly nationalists that Amy and James book um, uh, deals with these, these uh, the hillbilly uh, nationalists, and um, as well as my own Dunbar, Scots-Irish family. So I'll read from the book, just a short excerpt. Daniel Boone 
is the icon of settler colonialism. His life spanned from 1734 to 1820. Boone was born in the shadow of the Appalachians in Berks County, Pennsylvania, on the edge of British colonial settlement. He was an avatar of the moving settler indigenous frontier. To the west lay Indian country, claimed through the doctrine of discovery by Spain, Britain, France, but free of European settlers, save for a few traders, trappers, and soldiers manning colonial outposts. Daniel Boone himself was of Welch heritage, born in Pennsylvania, but most of those who followed his migrations west were Scots-Irish, the Ulster Scots. The Scots-Irish had been the settler colonialists of Northern Ireland, Ulster. Beginning in the early 1600s, the British decided to force Protestantism onto the Catholic Irish. They chose to use lowland Scotland Presbyterian Calvinists. When British colonization of North America began, many of these Ulster Scots chose to join. They were seasoned usurpers of indigenous property. The Western migration of Scots-Irish represented a mass movement between 1720 and the War of Independence. During the last two decades of the 18th century, first and second generation Scots-Irish settlers continued to migrate to the Ohio Valley, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. They cleared forests, built log cabins, and killed Indians, taking their cultivated land. Historian Carl Dagler writes, these hardy God-fearing Calvinists made themselves into a veritable human shield of colonial conquest. So I, you know, in reading that, I kind of wanted to provoke you to, um, to look at um, the um, uh, manifestation of the descendants of these people that you write about. You find them in Chicago. They're also in Cincinnati. They've moved to cities because the coal mining has ended. Um, farming, you know, is almost impossible, the kind of uh, subsistent farming. Um, they're unemployed. Um, they're, they're racist. They wear their, you know, have their Confederate flags and stuff. And how, you know, how was it that uh, um, they were, they were educated by the Black Panthers and tell about that more, that incredible thing. And then how can that be replicated? You know, uh, I think that's, you know, why you did the book. So if each of you would talk about that, I would, I think it would be great. James, why don't you go ahead and go first? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, Part of your question talks about the context of the times, you know, the the black freedom movement and all of its uh, In all of its expressions has always catalyzed resistance. It's always called the question, the age old question of what side are you on and uh, people like the Young Patriots organization rising up angry white lightning october 4th organization and many others uh, that had bases in uh, poor white communities uh, and working class white communities uh, were, they answered that question by saying, we know exactly where, what side we're on, right? But um, I think, you know, the, and we see a similar, similar process, it's not identical, but it's a similar process today, especially with the George Floyd uh, uprisings that happened, happened last year and the conversations around the Black Lives Matter are asking people to, uh, what side are you on, you know, and how far are you going to go? And um, I think, you know, we, we, we wrote this book, not because, any, you know, all of the, rather, all of these groups are in, inspiring for, for what they did and what they attempted to do. None of them were perfect, uh, but they answered the question very affirmatively. You know, we are uh, not only on the side of Black liberation, but we're on the side of Black liberation because it's a part and parcel of our own liberation as working class hum, uh, human beings. So, 
how do we make it happen again? Um, I would I would abandon the idea that we're gonna make it happen again in the exact same way. Yeah. But the spirit, the projects are incredibly salvageable and mm -hmm. updatable and are happening right now with you know many uh, you know many organizations across across the country have have sprung up and experimented what with what it's like to be in coalition, what it's like to be in alliance, and what it is like to be an a, a accomplice. So the good news is a lot of this work is being is happening right now. The bad news is that uh, with all of the ticking time bombs of disasters, uh, we have to add, consistently interrogate um, in our old models of organizing and, mo and mobilizing. Yeah. I um I'm thinking back. I appreciate the excerpt that you read, the provocation, Roxanne. And thinking back, I think that you write in Red Dirt that at some point in your family history, I think your relatives told you Daniel Boone was one of your forebears. And I remember being told the same thing, you know. Yeah. And I think that we get taught that our role models are um, people who take from others, and um, particularly for white folks and and white immigrants to this country. Um, that's what you're supposed to be proud of, right? And um, I came to this history and, and investigating the five organizations that James and I write about, um, looking for examples of times when people broke that tradition, when white folks broke that tradition um, and staked a claim to a different way of being. Um, and, you know, followed the footnotes and other books and just started to do research and, and through the process of doing that and asking questions about, you know, I'm, you know, how, how did these organizations come to be in an alliance with the Black Panthers to be working alongside um, the Third World Women's Alliance and Third World Liberation Groups? Um, you know, what was the coming to consciousness process? And, um, you know, for me, those are, those are my forebears. And I need to hold that um, complexity alongside my family's actual story. And so as we did research um, and, you um, met people who were involved in this history and conducted interviews, we came upon the story of a woman named Peggy Terry, um, who I know you met, Roxanne, in the 60s, and I'd love it if you wanted to talk about her more, but I feel like in so many ways, um, there's so many um, powerful stories that we write about in the book about coming to consciousness um, and learning to dedicate your life, but Peggy's really stood out to me um, because she was the daughter, granddaughter of a, a KKK member um, and the daughter of a Klan sympathizer um, and was actively raised in you know, a, a culture of uh, overt racism and segregation um, that lasted well into her 30s. And it wasn't until um, the Montgomery bus boycott that you know, she, she writes about, you know, it, it was seeing the violence so stark with her own eyes against the boycotters was the beginning of her becoming a better person, right? And I, I think that for me and this, the process in this book and questions I think about in my own life is like, how do we go beyond awareness? We become aware of racism and, you know, the, you know, panic over CRT or critical race theory would have you believe that that instantly makes people like ashamed and guilty. And instead, it actually can be the beginning of becoming a better person. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean just being aware and reading books. It means um, finding the way forward to dedicate your life to being anti-racist, as you said. And I think we, we trace that in the book in Peggy's story, but it's not only Peggy. Um, you know, all of the folks that we write about were um, steeped in in segregation and, and steeped in a racist culture, but they found that they had more in common and quite a lot in common um, with Black and Puerto Rican and other, you know, immigrant communities and indigenous communities in the United States, and they decided to fight together. Um, and so that's really what the book is about. And, and those are the questions that really drive me. Um, so what does it take to keep it going and keep, um, keep doing it? I, um, I think, like James said, um, we need new models and we need new ways. Um, I think that it definitely starts with people, you know, people's consciousness raising and connection with each other, being in community with each other, the process of political education that these organizers went through and the using of like, you know, just culture to meet people where they're at 
Um, and one of the things that Peggy was so great at was like the politics of the kitchen table. It's like you sit down with folks in your neighborhood and you're having conversations about hard things and you realize that they're afraid that, you know, expanding rights, civil rights or black power, that these things mean they have to give something up. And, you know, through that process of having conversation, doing political education, engaging around music and culture in the community organizing, um, you know, we can start to have conversations where we realize it's actually about making more for everyone um, and uh, you know, confronting the history of harm that has been done in this history, which we have to grapple with before we can move forward. Amy, you wanna read from the book a little bit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can. Um, let's see. I know, uh, Patrick, you asked a question about you know, sort of what's happened, what's been different since the, since we wrote the book, um, but I, I'd be happy to go there or if there's another topic you want us to touch on. <laughs> I, I think that'd be very interesting. Okay. Because, you know, it was how many years since uh, you write about, you write about the uh, early 70s, late 60s. Mm -hmm. And so that was so many years. And then we have another 10 years now. Another 10, a lot has happened in 10 a years. Lot's so. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to read from two different sections of the new edition. With the 10th anniversary of Hillbilly Nationalists, Urban Race Rebels, and Black Power, we revisit a time, the 60s and 70s, with a parallel moment of danger and possibility to today. Since the book was first published in 2011, we've witnessed the rise of authoritarianism across the globe and of white nationalist movements in the United States. We've seen once again, a fiercely reactionary conservatism take center stage in US politics alongside a dangerous mainstreaming, mainstreaming of far right ideas. The brutalities of racial capitalism are on full display as poor communities worldwide have been hit first and worse by crisis after crisis. During the last decade, a new wave of black freedom movements has also emerged with an explicitly intersectional analysis and so too have prolific movements for immigrant rights, indigenous sovereignty, climate justice, feminist and queer trans dignity, disability justice, and an end to xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Asian racism and war. Inspired by these movements and confronted with a continuous feed of disinformation and stark racial violence, Thousands of people, thousands of white people are waking up or recommitting to the cause of racial justice. Organizations across North America are mobilizing to define a contemporary solidarity politics while challenged by the task of confronting white nationalism and far right extremism that's long been left unchecked. So as in 1968, we are at a turning point and this generation's new left has the opportunity and imperative to build a united front against fascism for the 21st century. Given these conditions, there's no better time to learn the lessons of racial solidarity, class struggle and feminist leadership that was seated in the 60s, and especially to learn about the rainbow politics that defined the era's most visionary alliances. We focus here on the poor and working class white people who organized alongside communities of color to determine their own destinies and call for revolution, to understand how so-called hillbilly nationalists came to stand arm in arm with the Black Panthers, we must understand the longer legacy of rainbow politics in Chicago and beyond, beginning with Jobs or Income Now in Chicago and continuing with the Young Patriots organization, Rising Up Angry and its sister groups on the East Coast, White Lightning in the Bronx and October 4th organization in Philadelphia, this book traces a historical arc among these five community-based organizations and directly confronts that who can directly confronted white supremacy while struggling for the class interests of poor and working class white people. Out of necessity and strategy, they experimented with their own way to organize populations the broader left failed to reach. Their constituents include disaffected white youth, the chronically unemployed, welfare recipients, recovering drug users, day laborers, blue collar workers, and white ethnic communities. Inspired by black, the Black Power Movement's call to organize your own and part of a longer legacy of progressive populism in the United States, these poor white revolutionaries carved out a community organizing approach that addressed poor people's immediate needs, health, welfare, housing, jobs, drug addiction, police violence, while paying strategic attention to civil rights and multiracial coalitions. 
This approach opened direct links to similar struggles in communities of color, allow, allowing poor and working class whites to participate as actors, not just allies in the struggle for racial and economic justice. For this reason and many others, the nationalism of the hillbilly nationalists differs in every way from the white nationalism of today. Theirs was a nationalism focused on multiracial collaboration among working class people, inspired by anti-colonial struggles across the globe and in step with the revolutionary internationalism and socialism of the original Rainbow Coalition. Fantastic. Who's got a question? <laughs> response. Does the Poetry Center have any questions for us? Poetry Center went to sleep. Oh. <laughs> I'm looking to see. Are you guys want to uh, move on to some questions now or? Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, Go ahead and throw it. Yeah, well, Please, go ahead and throw your questions in the in the chat. Um, well, we have a question box, and I don't really have any questions at this moment. <laughs> I guess let me can I ask? Uh, let me ask uh, one question to uh, about hillbilly nationalists. So, towards the uh, you interview one of the old uh, young patriots at the end of the book, uh, mm -hmm. I Thurman. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I think uh, is, you say, boy, it was hard to find you. Um, and then he's like, yeah, a lot of us don't want to be found. Mm -hmm. What is that? What's in that? Yeah. Why, are, why don't they want to be? I mean, are these, is the old leadership, did they just, I don't know. It's, where called, are they? it's called PTSD from COINTELPRO. Yeah, I was going to say the answer is trauma. Um, for a lot of folks um yeah yeah the repression that they experienced um under COINTELPRO was you know pretty staggering and while some folks stayed active and in the movement it doesn't mean that they necessarily wanted to tell their story publicly again yes so the process of researching and writing the book for James and I took 10 years um we did more than 60 interviews and there was a lot of you know like a slow process of trust building and, um, you know, people would refer us to other folks to interview, um, but that doesn't mean that everybody was ready and eager to hop on the phone with two kids, basically, who, you know, they, they didn't know. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was after Hillbilly Nationalist was published in 2011 um, that through Peggy Terry's daughter, um, Hi got in contact with James and I. Um, and we've built a French, a, a wonderful friendship. He's a wonderful, wonderful person, um, since then. And, and he actually has a memoir out now called revolutionary hillbilly. Um, that was sort of part of the process of, of filling in his story, his piece of the story. Um, and then in this new edition, we include an interview with him at the back. I should point out when you do this type of radical history, especially for somebody who's in the generation right behind the people that you're interviewing, you're not just asking people about their politics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, by the by, just by going and asking people about their politics and their activities, you're also asking them about um, exes, ex husbands, ex wives, kids, relationships, mistakes, regrets. You know those things come up, and uh, you know part like Amy said, part of it is the point of uh, building trust, trying to figure out what accountability uh, look, looks like in, in, in these processes and uh, being as, as accountable as possible while still following the evidence wherever it may lead. Yeah, I mean, I certainly see, I think the, uh, the issue of trauma is really huge. And I think a lot of the methods that we use to squelch dissent were incredibly effective and you know, just got awful. Uh, we got some questions. Um, in any of your histories, do you have in your books how mental asylums was used to squelch dissidents? Dissidents, the people. Have you dealt I with wish that? I, I, dealt I with wish that? I thought of that. I, I really wish I had thought of, of doing that, but no, it's not in my book. Yeah. Um, sure. I think I, uh, I do deal with trauma uh, intergenerational trauma. I think that's one thing that is uh, plaguing um, 
a lot of people in the United States, uh, the intergenerational trauma from enslavement, uh, the inter uh, genocide for Native Americans, uh, the border for Mexican people, especially that false border that was created by war uh, that is illegal. It's an illegal border. I have a whole chapter on that, that trauma. Um, the United States invaded and, and after two years occupied Mexico City and with a gun at the head of the uh, government, they had to sign over the northern half. That's, that's not legal. You know, that's not a legal transfer. So that border is, um, is unstable and it's going to stay unstable. And people look away, you know, from what's going on there. It's every administration, that's one thing they all have in common, is trying to suppress people at the border. And um, so that trauma reverberates throughout the country with every single person that gets through there, who doesn't get through there, of their relatives they're trying to get to, children that are separated. Um, so, you know, there are no really uh, mental care. There's no funding for mental care in the United States. Um, and, and this trauma goes on and on. And I think immigrants, what I found in, in writing this book is, is uh, there's just a huge um, uh, trauma of being immigrants. And as, as um, Don um, uh, Viet uh, Nguyen, the great writer, you know, surrounded and committed and um, this wonderful book, Nothing Ever Dies, I use his work a lot because he makes a point that I had never thought of, that we use the word immigrant. I know that, you know, I try to make the difference between immigrant and settler, but he makes another point that there are very few actual immigrants to the United States. They should be considered refugees. And most of them are refugees of wars and messes the United States have made in their countries. And that's not true of hardly any other place, you know, and it's not admitted. Uh, so the, it, the war, the trauma of war, the men, you know, the, the trauma of refugees, um, and that becomes intergenerational too. It's Cambodian and Laotians and Vietnamese and now, you know, Afghans and um, uh, Mexicans all the time. So we definitely need, um, but mental institutions, uh, the, the person who asked the question is, is certainly right that they've mainly been used to suppress, uh, you know, to, in the past to suppress any kind of dissidence. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, a very good question. I see another one um, that I really like is the hillbilly racism different from the urban liberal racism. What do you all think about that, James? Or any? What's the difference in these, you know, the, the racism that has to be overcome by the, quote, hillbilly uh, and the liberal racism? Uh, I'll, I'll harken back to Robin D.G. Kelly's uh, great quote saying that there's no universal experience of white supremacy. I mean, sorry, of uh, white skin privilege. And, uh, yeah. you know, and certainly that experience is vastly different on where you sit uh, in, term, in terms of class. Um, but that, I would say that, uh, you know, there are more opportunities, uh, you know, there, there are literally more opportunities for working class people to break with racism than there are for middle class uh, people, uh, largely because of proximity. You know, I, I think that uh, workplace organizing has been kind of poo-pooed and out of fashion up until recently. And I think that that's, that's one, of, one of the places, uh, besides recovery programs and churches, where people of different backgrounds actually meet and can influence one another. Um, so, um, so yeah, all racism uh, across, the, across the board, all forms of white advantage need to be completely undermined. Uh, but I guess our message, uh, Amy, uh, message has been, 
you know, don't don't sit around in a in, in a liberal bubble and assume that uh, poor people are automatically racist or you know or blame white supremacy on poor people because it's a cross class phenomenon. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a really great question because I do think that um, the way we organize around racism based on class is different. I think that, um, you know, wealth um, and profit building under racial capitalism is, the, you know, the, the most durable scaffolding for white supremacy. It relates to wealth um, and wealth building. So where you sit in the system and based on your stake in the system, um, and the really unattainable promise of some of that wealth for the majority of people changes um, what you might see as possible or, or how we might talk about racism. Um, and I think that, you know, the liberal racism or, you know, racism among progressives is something that often isn't talked about. And it's certainly um, part of what showed up for the groups that we wrote about in terms of you know, the focus on the student movement or people's assumptions that poor and working class white people were, you know, beyond hope. Um, so we have this idea that poor and working class white people are somehow more hardened racists. And I think that it lets, um, you know, liberal and progressive communities, white folks off the hook um, in a way that's really dangerous um, and obscures power and obscures the stake in wealth building that racial capitalism is set up to afford white folks who are middle class and upper class, um, you know, access. And um, so racism is racism, right? But it comes in different flavors. And I think how we organize, how we talk about it is different. And we do, we, we can't, you know, ignore the fact that um, folks who have, who have a stake in maintaining the wealth and power um, and privilege that they have, you know, are going to cling in different ways, and you know, throw up all kinds, throw up all kinds of smoke screens, which has been my experience, <laughs> like dealing with racism in progressive circles. So, uh, another question about social media, which we haven't really touched on. Uh, social media seems to present the myth that one can educate others with reactionary political views through argument on those platforms. My experience tells me that this is a waste of energy, which could be channeled more strategically. Many of us don't know how to do that. I see little opportunity in my life to directly change people's hearts and minds effectively. Thoughts, and then that goes with another question about how do we most effectively build on the lessons contained in your books? Yeah, I think people want, um... Well, you know, we were going to talk some about why why we write and what the purpose is. And I think what the purpose is, is to suggest uh, some possibilities for solutions to, you know, some of these issues. And it's hard to know where to begin, but I think in the United States more than, you know, I think different societies are different and maybe differences within the United States, but I do think the the um, the history, you know, the the uh, deficit of historical understanding, you know, what were just like, you know, the um, the poor white the white nationalists. I don't think most people understand. Maybe even not a lot of white nationalists themselves understand that they uh, they come from these original settlers, almost all of them, you know, I try to profile as many as I can, you know, studying the white nationalists in my next book, and a lot of that was in Loaded, the Second Amendment book. Um, I think probably 90% of the, you know, the multiple gun owners in the United States are direct descendants of original settlers, you know, the, the Scots, Irish, and Anglo- um, uh, settlers or wannabes, you know, <laughs> you know that that have sort of taken on that that, uh, and they carry with them the burden of settlerism without being aware that it even existed. You know what the role of their ancestors were, even if they didn't own slaves. You know, like the Appalachians, there was not that much slave owning. It, it existed, but only because they could not afford to buy slaves. And there was a lot of resentment, but these, this original settlerism, they think it's their country and everyone else is a visitor forever. 
and their descendants are visitors. I know from the community I grew up in that that's the attitude. Um, I was very lucky to have a grandfather, Scots Irish grandfather, who chose to be a socialist instead of a white nationalist. So that that's very rare because most of those socialists were were German uh, immigrant socialists and. Um, Italian anarchists <laughs> and not, you know, descendants of, uh, of settlers. But I was influenced by that. And that that's a, you know, it's a little seed, not some of my brothers and sisters were not, you know, but I was. Um, so I think that if that's explained to people that burden, not to make them feel guilty about their past, but to say a kind of, aha, that's why I'm like I am. You know, it's not my fault. I mean, I, you know, th this has been, it, it, it is beneficial um, to the um, ruling class of this country. And there is a ruling class in this country, a capitalist ruling class to keep people separated, to commodify people into units, small units and not community. Social media, back to social media is very good at that. You know, we're all, you know, we're, we're little commodities interchanging with each other and less and less community. And of course the pandemic has made community very, even more difficult. I um, I really appreciate this question because um, I, I think, you know, social media and technology is obviously a double-edged sword. Um, there's so much power and possibility and potential for people to speak, tell their truths, speak their stories and connect with each other. And on the other hand, it's being, or it's being used to organize people, um, in all the worst ways. And, um, I would just say like, you know, when James and I were coming up, we'd go to punk rock shows, and, um, you know, if someone was trying to, you know, a neo-Nazi or a white nationalist was trying to organize in the community, they'd show up at the show and people would kick them out. Um, and now you've got these online spaces where the same process of, of, of repressive and regressive organizing is happening online, but it's largely one-to-one. -one. There's no one around to witness it because it's happening in people's homes, in their phone, on YouTube, um, in these channels and these forums. Um, and we can't afford to ignore it. Um, so as much as it might feel like a double-edged sword and we all want to ignore what's going on, if we don't organize and present alternatives and actually explain the world that we're fighting for and what it really means in terms of benefit to human beings, um, someone else is organizing those folks and it's around the men's rights movement or it's around um, racism and, and far-right ideology. Um, and we're seeing it happen more and more. And so we, we can't afford to ignore social media or write it off. I think in terms of this question about um, opportunity to do it, um, you know, it, it's not so effective engaging just one-on-one -on -one with somebody in a chat channel or, or um, you know, trying to organize them away from these ideas because what's happening is people are being, people are being bombarded um, with this information, this disinformation and the algorithm is set up to bring people down a rabbit hole and like fill their echo chamber with the same types of ideas. Um, so I think we need to get more savvy at media um, and flood things in the opposite direction. And I think we need to do that as organized groups, not as individuals in chat rooms or in comments having like spam flame wars flying back and forth in somebody's comment thread. And we need to get back to talking to people one-on-one -on -one however we can. Um, and really doing that in community. And so it just, to me, it feels like concentric circles of having real conversations with real people in real time. Um, and also like working together to, to sort of um, address the, the infrastructure of the internet that allows this to happen, the problems with the algorithms and the, the media savvy that we need in order to counter the way that people are being organized online into the far right. I think um, DSA, um, my, I, I guess it's different, you know, it's different. There are a lot of different chapters, different things, but my experience with DSA in the last few years and with this, you know, the, the should make us rethink electoral politics as a, um, 
area of organizing, which the left usually ignores, but a lot of left. I just know in Oklahoma, you know, I work with young people there a lot over, you know, many years. I mean, they're most of the young people I, I've worked with are older now, but there are younger people. But it's really interesting in the 2016 election, uh, and then again uh, in the um, uh, 2000, this one, this last one, in the primary, in the uh, Democratic primary. Now, mind you, only 25% of the state is Democratic Party. Um, it's a fully Republican place. But uh, in the Democratic Party, um, Bernie won, you know, the DSA won. It's very organized, uh, the DSA in, in places like rural Oklahoma. A lot of these people are just rural young people. And they like DSA, they have chapters all over the place. So I use Oklahoma as, you know, about the most reactionary place there is, is my, you know, my radar of um, what's going on in Texas and the South. And what High Thurman is doing and others from, you know, the, the veterans of the hillbilly nationalists in Chicago, um, organizing these young people, getting them uh, out of groups they're in, I think that's important, but also getting them before they would be recruited to a white nationalist group. You know, um, I think that's extremely important work to be doing now. And your book is, it, you know, is a, is a um, definitely a tool for that that's really important. Well, you had mentioned, you were just talking about younger people. I did have a, we did have a question about wondering if there's any dynamic youth movements in particular that you like to follow in the past one to four years. I don't know. DSA. <laughs> DSA. <laughs> All of them. Um, there's some incredible, incredible youth organizing. I mean, I think it's also worth pointing out that the history that we're writing about, the, the folks that we write about in our book were literal teenagers um, and in their early 20s when they started many of these organizations. Um, and so they were youth organizers at the time. And, um, and, you know, I think now there's, I mean, there's just so many organizers that, you know, young people, we got to speak about a week, two weeks ago um, with uh, Dan Diwe Abdullah from the Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard. I think there's some incredible youth organizing work happening right now um, around indigenous sovereignty, which I'm sure Roxanne can talk about um, around um, the second amendment um, and gun control, I think around climate, um, the sunrise movement stands out and there's just, I mean, there's so many, so much incredible youth organizing happening all the time and we need to pay attention now that I'm, now that I'm old. <laughs> yeah. And I'll put in a, a word for the red nation. Uh, mm -hmm. You can, you know, go and Google it. It's a, an amazing youth, uh, mainly youth. I mean, anyone can join, but uh, very, very um, committed uh, young people. Chapters now all over the country it started in, in New Mexico uh, around homeless people, you know, homeless Navajos being killed and, and abused and uh, built into an amazing organization just took off, you know, it's just taken off. It's very popular and um, I think when leadership, it's really important. It was important in, you know, in, in the 60s when leadership comes from um, uh, Native peoples, um, organizations and Black organizations and, and Latino, um, that, you know, supporting those organizations is very important because that's where the influence on young white kids can come from, you know, just like it, it did in um, uh, the work that uh, uh, the Black Panther Party did. They, very, they were very conscious about this kind of organizing, I think. Well, that's excellent. You know, I think uh, we're going to start winding down a little bit, maybe. Do you, anybody have? It, is Josiah Luis in... in uh, around or do you guys like to have final comments? Is there things you've been wanting to ask each other and never have? Oh. I just want to say thank you to Roxanne for all your 
you know, your, your work and your writing over the years. I, I think that I, you know, I truly believe you, you don't organize people by telling them everything is wrong with them and <laughs> what not to do, what not to say, what not to be. Um, you organize people by modeling a different way. Um, and as a younger person finding Roxanne's books um, and seeing that like the life of uh, the, the life of a writer, seeing uh, the life of someone who's committed to uncovering these histories, um, seeing a different way to be um, is it's, it's part of how we get where we need to go. And Roxanne has been a part of that. I'm so grateful for our friendship. This new book is absolutely incredible. And I really hope that everyone picks it up. Yes. James? Well, we ha you, have to, you have to stick with it, you know, and not give up. Never give up. <laughs> we will get there. Well, I also want to thank uh, the Poetry Center. And this yes. is also involved with the Howard Zinn Book Fair. It's one of our co-presenters, which may resurface someday, I hope. Someday. And also uh, from the Green Arcade, you can get all, all the books are on uh, shopthegreenarcade.com. Uh, and then I would love to somehow figure out in our COVID world how we can get Roxanne to sign some books for me. Um, oh, yeah. They can be left <laughs> on stairways, you know, they can be whatever. We can maybe figure something out uh, for signing. And James, you're you going to say something for bye bye? Um, actually, I just want to say there was some confusion on whether. Um, my dear friend Josiah Luis Aldarete is here in the Zoom room, but he is here. That's good. So, okay. um, so that um, I just want to introduce Josiah. We've traveled all around the country together as part of the Molotov Mouse Outspoken Word Troop, and you got to buy the book that Patrick is holding up. It will blow your mind. It will any if any small book has a chance of decolonizing everything. It's hey, going to there. Be is. There you go. Josiah. You lead us out, brother? Yeah, yeah, happy to. Uh, buenas noches, familia. What a beautiful event. Um, yeah, I, I just, if you permit me to ramble for one minute before I start, I really want to thank uh, Amy and Roxanne and James uh, for being our memoria because uh, este país no tiene memoria. This place doesn't want us to have a memory. So we repeat these mistakes and these things and we don't know these. So it's it, it's a profound thing to hear these three people speaking of what they're speaking about. Um, yeah, you know, a, a, a people with memory is a rebel people, uh, like a mural, uh, a Zapatista mural I once saw says. So uh, being here with you all means a lot, as well as being here with my poet, Hermana Leticia, who's Poetry is also memoria. So uh, I'm gonna take us out with a, another memoria. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that this is the 500 year uh, anniversary, uh, for lack of a better word, of the Spanish invasion of the Mexica Empire. Uh, 500 years ago, the pinches españoles invaded, contaminated, destroyed one of the most amazing civilizations in Mesoamerica. Uh, so for me, memoria is important. We hear it in the pages of, of, of heroes like James and Roxanne and Amy, but we also have it inside of ourselves because the colonizer takes these things away from us. And as much as they do, we have the memoria in our sangre. We have the memory in our blood. We have it in our bones. We have it in the voices of our ancestors that talk to us in our hearts. So what I want to end with tonight is a, um, a poem of the Mexica city of Tenochtitlan, which if I read the colonizer's history, there's no memory of that city for me. I have to go inside myself. And when I do that, that's when I see it. So this is a Tenochtitlan and Tecnicolor dedicated to our beautiful city. Tenochtitlan in Tecnicolor. 
Mexica City across time and space over 500 years later, I now see you with my own culturas ojos. Inside of each of us, you still exist. Our views of you are passed along to us through our ancestors' memorias and dream recollections and not the lying, guilty history written down by the colonizers, Tenochtitlan in Technicolor. There you are, dreaming city on the surface of Lake Texcoco, shimmering at night under la luz de Cuyul Shuacui, Azuli Rojo on your temple walls, dream tones, God colors. Plumas of copal rising up out of you all the way to el cielo and back down deep into the fifth direction of each of us. The comets flew across el cielo, weeping fuego for you. Lake Texcoco bubbled and boiled warnings around you. The ash gray heron with the mirror on its forehead was caught and reflected what was to become of you, dreaming city. Inside of each of us, you still exist. Tenochtitlan in Technicolor. Even though we were baptized not to, even though we were tortured not to, we still remember your grand temples to Huitzilopochtli and Tlaloc. We still remember the movimientos of your sagrado rituals during celebrations. We still remember the noise and smells coming from the zoo and jardines of Moctezuma. We remember your grand avenue looking upon Cotlique before she was Tonatzin, before she was Mary, before, they, before she was who they say she was before the crucifix billboards, before the beheadings, before the baptisms, before the pinche Franciscan friars and their secret psychedelical midnight mass. And man, where do you think that they scored their sacraments from? Before all of that dreaming city, we wandered through you holding giant bouquets of amarillo y naranjada colored flores, and we held them up to el cielo to give the sagrado espiritus a place to rest inside of each of us. You still exist, Tenochtitlan in Technicolor. We remember you before the gray mechanizations of the conquistadors and what they called civilization, their steel and diseases that killed us quicker than any crucified God's wrath. We remember the early mornings cuando the mist covered the lake around you and it seemed like you were floating dreaming city. Your wooden bridges disappearing into the hazy distance and going off into our Mexica dreams. The pain we feel today, that pain we feel today are from wounds that bled onto your stones, colonized infected wounds whose pain we feel in the past, present and future. Your pyramids and temples rise up out of us cada mañana. Your buildings, dream silhouettes, splash under our view of La 24 and shape today's quinto sol horoscopes of what will become of us, dreaming city. I have woken from mis sueños, looked out my window, and there you were just across the water. But before me, ojos are all the way open, before the dream completely disappears, you disappear. And my view of you suddenly turns into the Polaroid pictures that the conquistadors took. I can no longer see you through the glare of white man's burden electricity. I can no longer see you past the piles of genocidal greeting cards and colonized holiday decorations that they use as history. I can no longer see you without hearing the knock-knock jokes that the missionaries told the corpses of the Mexica after they baptized and killed them. But no matter where they hide you or how far we are forced to move away from you, dreaming city, we will always find you. 
You were a geographic location. Just as much as you are a Mexica state of mind, a metropolis that housed our truths and our science, how could we ever truly forget that? Your stones are in our corazones por siempre. And one day we will build you again because inside of each of us, you still exist. Tenochtitlan and Technicolor. Gracias, familia. Aquí estamos y no los vamos. People with memories are rebel people. Thank you, Giselle Luis. Gracias, Patrick. Oh my gosh. Hey, you guys, can we all get on now and just have a love fest? Ooh. Hey, Tizia. Hey. <laughs> Beautiful evening. Thank you so much. I feel so. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Roxanne. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Happy birthday Roxanne. Happy birthday. Feliz cumple. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Josiah. That was amazing. I, I've got to read. I want to read it. <laughs> well, my stuff, if you send me your address, I would be proud to send you a book. Thank you. Thank you. Real, I, real. I, I consider it an honor. Yeah. Thank you, Steve Dickerson, too. Thanks, Poetry Center. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, thank you to both of our, our amazing poets for uh, lifting this this uh, this powerful event to the next level with your great poetry. Thank Incredible. you. Yeah, and thank you to our publishers as well. Um, you know, it's not always that you get to do a 10th anniversary edition. So we're really grateful to Melville House um, for seeing the need for this book and the continued interest in it and letting us add some things. So. Yeah, and if people read it 10 years ago, they should get this book because uh, it's amazing. It's a lot of new material and also quite a beautiful book. Oh, we also have a study guide we forgot to mention. So if you if you go to the link that was shared earlier from Melvo House's website um, for the page with our book, there is a discussion guide on there that has a little something for everyone. We're really proud of our study guide. The revolution is only one study guide away. <laughs> That's great. I think it rocks. Did you, did you have a new book? Do you have a, a new book? Oh. oh, I can't hear her. But you're on mute. There you go. Ah. Did you just ask me? Sorry. Yeah, I asked if you have a new book. Uh, I do not have a new book entirely to myself but I am in a very excellent new anthology okay. um, put out by uh, Cutthroat Publications. And I have a, a new short story in this one. Oh, great, so, I got to get that. Yeah, Puro Chicanex Writers of the 21st Century. This came out last <laughs> December. So awesome. yeah, thanks for asking. Oh, I can't wait to get that. Oh, look at that. Who joined us? Uh, this is Fulano. This is Fulano Oh, it's beautiful. He loves Zoom calls. He loves Zoom chats. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Did he ever get up in your face and make you quit talking? My cat used to do that. No, but he, he once bit me when one of his favorite poets was supposed to be on Zoom. And when I called the guy's name, he, he didn't, he wasn't in the Zoom world with us. He bit me. 